welcome uh, i welcome the learners uh, to this uh, teleconferencing on uh, the socio psychological approach uh, views of uh, abraham maslow and frederick hertzberg i am vayu nandan from the faculty of public administration school of social sciences igno and uh, i have along with me dr jaya chitravedi to discuss on this approach so one of the very important approach in uh, public administration we also try to reflect this in our bachelor degree program and also recently we have launched post graduate level public admin that is i mean public administration there also in our course on administrative theory this views have been reflected in one of the units today both of us will be discussing and uh, the various aspects and views of abraham maslow and frederick hertzberg in relation to socio psychological approach other way it is also called the motivational theories first of all before we try to discuss about the maslow and hertzberg in their views why motivations are important because earlier to these scholars the first school that is which we come across classical school which basically talks about the the methods the machine and the process of organization leaving apart the human aspects of the organization it feels that once the the organization is being designed based on certain principles automatically the human beings try to fit into it and try to i mean function efficiently but later this has been disputed by the human relation school stating that the human relations are most important that interpersonal relations first of all you have to look into it then the comes the organization or whatever the functioning of organization depends upon the how best the interpersonal relations of the human beings are then later we also come across other school that is the behavioral school which try to study the human behavior in the organization taking the the assistance of psychology sociology and anthropology because they feel that the behavior of human be and the behavior in the organization if you want to really look in deep in depth you have to take the assistance of sociology that is sociology is nothing but study of society where the man comes from and psychology is nothing but the science of the human behavior and anthropology it is the evolution of human kind and also it should be an has to have an interdisciplinary approach and also to relate it with the environmental aspects also within the behavioralism uh, no doubt we come across various subsections like we have a participative management group which try to integrate the individual with the organization and one way we also say that socio psychological approach where it is mostly talks how the person should be motivated to not only fulfill his needs but also try to fulfill the needs of the or the objectives of the goals of the organization no doubt the pure behavioralism talked about the human behavior where we try to discuss uh, look at, i mean mostly by simon and also chester barnard they try to say how the behavior is important and how it should be analyzed so in the same way we try to understand that simon says that no doubt the principles which have been provided to design our organization mostly is to see how the action is been implemented but before the action naturally the action depends on decision how this decision is arrived, arrived no one has looked into it where lies the important aspect of human behavior he says that if in any organization analysis has to be done we have to have both the principle principles which provides the human being to take a, a effective decision and a principle which are there to see that decision is properly implemented then there are within the behaviorism which i said earlier also that their group of people how to they, their main intention is how to integrate the individual with the organization that is 
along with the organizational growth the individual should also grow but the classical school tries to see that they never try to look from the individual but they mostly look towards the organizational growth but never try to look into the growth of the individual so one way they look the human being more as an immature they never try to make him mature person like an i mean other way they say it's a child they, a child naturally grows adult in the same way when a person joins the organization i think he should also grow that kind of condition should be given by the organization that itself provides for the growth of the individual and also the growth of the organization so we have rensis lickert and chris hergeris and all those persons how to integrate the individual then coming to the other group that is called where they try to look into the motivational aspects of the human beings how they can be motivated how they can be integrated with the organizational working by fulfilling their needs so the first person we come across is the abraham maslow if you try to look at abraham maslow who is a a psychologist i think he is mostly try to understand the uh i'm sorry there's a lot of noise coming out if you try the abraham maslow i think uh, one i mean who is a psychologist earlier we have seen mostly persons who are the practitioners or the the scholars of public administration but in this case maslow who is a psychologist i think uh, he try to understand the human behavior through psychoanalysis and uh, his research is also i think based on his own uh, interest uh, and because being a psychologist uh, try to provide solution to the uh, i mean various uh, personal and uh, i mean various personal and ethical and uh, scientific problems rather than to prove or demonstrate so that way his experience as a psychologist i think maybe uh, provided or contributed to this what we call the hierarchy of uh, human needs or uh, what you call uh, i mean uh, the hierarchy of needs which he is try to propound basically as i said his uh, mostly contribution is based on his experience and uh, one thing is he was very clear that his theory is not synonymous with the behavioral theory and the he feels that the motivations are the only one class of uh, determinants of the behavior that means there are other things also which influence the behavior but he is try to say one important determinants of the and he also said that behavior is always motivated always i mean sorry the behavior is uh, is almost always motivated and it is also almost always biological cultural situational and determined as well so this is what he try to come out and try to uh, come out with this what is called the hierarchy of needs so he feels that uh, he hypo- he is basic hypothesis are that uh, man is a satisfy satisfaction seeking animal once he is satisfied naturally he tries to motivate and try to but those needs which i which satisfy is no longer will satisfy him so he has to climb for another set of needs and another important hypothesis he states that human motivation to action arises from certain dri- driving needs common to all persons so this is another important aspect which he tries to say that he is only motivated to action arising from a certain driving needs common to all persons and the other important hypothesis says the satisfied need, need no longer motivates the behavior once he is satisfied with the those needs which are so the, they will not be motivating further and lastly says it is only a need a person is striving to satisfy it that motivates a behavior pattern so this is what uh, we try to understand about and he comes out with the identify five types of human needs which are arranged in a hierarchical manner the first comes the the physiological needs the second comes the safety 
needs and the third comes the social needs and the fourth one comes as the esteem needs and lastly he, he talks about self actualization needs so he maintains that these are the needs in an hierarchical order and uh, the first which he said that the person who is motivated basically he has first thing he comes a driving force is nothing but the physiological needs and these physiological needs are nothing but they satisfy his physiological needs such as hunger thirst shelter and sex and other bodily needs so that means i mean one way the any person or any human being needs a wanted a physical means to survive so these are the needs which is the most important needs to start with so these needs are not only to start they are also i think essential to sustain a life itself so that way i think this needs tends to have highest strength until they somewhat are satisfied so initially this physiological needs are very important to sustain a life or to assert himself the basic needs which are in common to any person so these are the needs which motivates a person to join an organization once these needs are fulfilled as is said earlier also that once the needs are satisfied those needs are further will not be i mean satisfy him in the next in the hierarchy he says once these needs are fulfilled that is the physiological needs then i think the person will try to i think i mean derive satisfaction or motivation from the what is called the safety and security needs so this safety and security needs once you have stabilized yourself you say i mean yourself with your the i mean hunger shelter sex and body bodily needed other things now you want to have a safety and security so from what from the physical danger and other things so in the process if you take the how this kind of security needs are been provided if you take the organizational context i think uh, we normally get this kind of needs by job security pension schemes insurance and other welfare aspects so that way he will try to look into those needs which provides him safety and security once that physiological needs are been provided so once these needs are also been provided i think the next step he tries to i mean drive for what is called the social needs so the word social itself i think we can understand that he tries to seek an companionship and also what you call affection or a sense of belongingness and also acceptance from other fellow beings so one way they are also called the love needs and in that way i this i think uh, mostly and one thing we have to understand love is not synonymous with sex sex is always in the physiological needs so some sort of a social try to be having some sort of acceptance i mean affiliation, uh, affiliation. and uh, that is what we try to understand about this safety needs once the safety needs are been sorry social needs are been provided the next in the line we come across what is called the esteem needs the word esteem itself indicates that i think the esteem factors that is the self respect autonomy independence achievement so again in this needs also we have two categories of needs one way we may call it as what we call the internal esteem needs or the external esteem needs the internal esteem needs one way they are called achievement needs the external needs are called recognition needs the internal esteem needs we may try to look into such as status uh, sorry self respect autonomy achievement whereas the external uh, factors we try to look at uh, i mean to the status sorry status recognition and attention so these needs uh, try to Uh, some sort of derive some sort of self confidence prestige power control and capability and uh, and this way i think it creates a some sort of a a status and a credibility and a, a position in the society 
So once I think these uh, needs are being achieved, and next in the line that is the last which he tries to talk about the self actualization. So I think self actualization is something what we try to understand something some sort of a meaning in your life. I mean you try to achieve. Uh, I think I mean I mean other words I think it means one uh, what one is capable of becoming. And uh, no doubt uh, this is what the ultimate need and one way it may be he says this is the end of the what we understand is the uh, the driving need and which satisfy. Maybe this are what he try to understand that these are the basic needs which are to be provided to a which are really motivating a person to join an organization not only fulfill his needs but also fulfill the organization. Maybe uh, what we try to I mean understand or what we try to have what we feel the implication of this theory is that uh, I think what he says what I mean by this is implication that a happy worker or a satisfied worker is a productive worker. So that is the work should satisfy him that means one way the work should uh, fulfill his needs. So this is the one of the first implication about the Maslow I mean what we call the hierarchy of needs. So the happy worker is a productive worker how he will be happy that the work which he is to supposed to do in the organization should satisfy him. How it satisfy? By fulfilling his needs. So this is the first implication about the uh, Maslow's uh, theory and the second implication what we try to understand is that I mean no doubt uh, this theory may not may tender in a bureaucratic organization or somewhat it may be outdated because in a bureaucratic organization hierarchy, specialization, impersonality and all this I mean ultimate. So in the process I think this may not be possible in a bureaucratic organization. So that way the implication is one way we said that the happy worker is the worker who is the real productive work but other way is it is a highly impossible in a bureaucratic organization because bureaucratic has certain kind of hierarchy and it cannot follow it cannot may provide these kind of things and it may one way it says that it is not possible in bureaucratic organization other way it says that it is I mean this theory requires democratization of traditional bureaucratic organizations. So this is the implications. So one way you say happy worker is the real productive worker and a productive worker means the work itself provides satisfaction, satisfaction means he fulfill needs. But it is not possible in a bureaucratic organization because it is highly rigid, highly structured. In this process it is impossible to have these kinds of needs. So it, 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 the implication is that it is not possible in bureaucratic organization and one way I think this theory requires democratization of traditional bureaucratic organization. Then coming to the what is the the criticism about his organization I mean is first thing is people yes you have any theory or a concept first thing is what is what is the on what basis you have come arrived it what is the data available and uh, how you have developed this is there any survey or any kind of a research. But what I earlier also I said it is simply because he is a psychologist through his experiences he tried to come out with it. So that way one thing which we try to I mean that there is no data or, or a data does not or nor available data does not I mean one way support this hierarchy of needs. And the second is that whatever hierarchy has arranged. I mean may human being may necessarily do not follow this hierarchy. How do you say this? Because the physiological needs I mean maybe I mean he can attain I mean if more Wealthy I mean uh, well I mean he may get in other organization also he may same for physiological needs or safety needs or security needs he may go to other organization. Like you have a pay you have a recognition in one organization you have better recognition you may go. So that does not mean that you are climbing the hierarchy in the same horizon I mean lay, lay, going on. So it may not be rigidly follow, followed. And the other is that 
I mean, what they try to understand is there are number of ways to satisfy same need in the hierarchy. Like he says that uh, there are variations. I mean, for instance, some people earn self-esteem by earning more money. Some people earn self-esteem simply because of getting status. So it varies from person to person. In the same way, I think uh, the what we try to understand is that this self-actualization. What is the ultimate goal? Like I mean, I'm giving an example. So in a, in a what we try to understand in the this kind of our situation in university situation, lecturer want to become a reader, reader wanted to become a professor, professor. I said professor is our ultimate. But again, a professor want to become a register, register want to. I mean, he want to become a vice chancellor. Then he want to become a chairman of UGC if available. I mean, so there is nothing like what is called self actualization. It is very difficult. It again. I think we try to look. I mean, it may be different to different people. So one thing, one great thing about uh, I mean, Maslow, in spite of what whether, whether the data is available or available data can validate. But one thing is he has come out with what really motivates a person. What are the needs which motivates a person? That is what is important. Maybe the hierarchy which he has tried to provide may not be valid. But the thing which we try to understand is that he tries to, I mean, come out and he try to specify that what are the needs which motivates a person and what exact how what kinds of needs. So this is what we try to look into. The. So now I request uh, uh, Jaya Chaturvedi to, I mean, reflect or the views of uh, the Frederick Herzberg on his what is called the two-factor theory or what is called hygienic and motivational theories. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vayunandan. I think with this uh, understanding, we must have uh, understood that public administration, firstly, is both an art and a science. And uh, that is said because theory has to constantly draw upon uh, practice and practice has to draw upon theory conversely. And that is what makes public administration an applied field of administration. It's not purely academic. When we are talking of motivation, we are talking of, we are delving into the psychology of human being. And there are both rational and extra rational and irrational impulses which sort of, which are behind motivation. Now, it is very difficult, for instance, to understand somebody like Gandhi, or maybe understand somebody, uh, maybe, a, maybe a soldier in the army who sort of, who can give up. And when we are talking of self-actualization, we are talking of people who can bypass physiological security and social affiliation needs and get, get uh, straight off to self-actualization. So we talk of self-actualization, we are talking of, let's say in the profession of academics, we are talking of somebody becoming an ideal teacher, or maybe in the field of civil service, somebody becoming an ideal civil servant, instead of just looking for promotions and perks and pays. So I think with this brief understanding of Maslow and a brief reflection on what uh, Dr. Vayunandan has just given you, I think I'll start with Frederick, Frederick Herzberg's uh, two-factor theory. He also talks about uh, hygiene and motivation factors. Before I, before I sort of start with hygiene and motivation factors, I will just try to bring out the difference between human relations and the behavioral school uh, in public administration theory. Now, human relations talked about interpersonal relations at the workplace. It mainly talked about informal organization. That is, two people get along very well together. They are bound to work more productively. And the behavioral school was more diagnostic, it was very scientific, it got into uh, the psychological proofings of human mind, it tried to understand what motivates a person, whether it is money, whether it is perks, whether it is social environment. And it is very important to understand that each approach is a progression over the earlier approach. It is not a sort of a negation of the earlier approach. If you're talking of classical approach, Max Weber was an improvement over classical principles. Human relations was an improvement over uh, the Max Weber's theory of bureaucratic functioning. And behavioral movement was a further improvement over human, human relations school of thought. So when we have to understand an organization and working of people inside an organization, we have to take a holistic perspective of all schools of thought. All right, now let's come down to Frederick Herzberg and his two-factor theory. Uh, Herzberg says there are two factors which can, which can be classified as hygiene factors and as motivation factors. Now, hygiene factors are those factors which will not exactly motivate you, but they are more like maintenance factors. Maintenance factors means that essential things that will make you stay in an organization, but will not sort of 
add anything to your productivity or to your uh, to your personality or to your contribution to an organization and the second set of factors are motivation factors or factors that will uh, do the reverse which means that will motivate you that will sort of uh, explore the many dimensions of your personality that will make you contribute a lot better to your organization which make you progress as an individual towards let's say self actualization and sort of progresses your organization further so what are the hygiene factors? Hygiene factors according to Frederick Herzberg will be number one, let's say he says supervision is a hygiene factor. Okay? Interpersonal relations at the workplace are a hygiene factor. Yes. Salary, pays and perks are a hygiene factor. Okay. Now let us just sort of try to critically analyze hygiene factors. Now I've told you hygiene factors are factors that do not motivate. Okay? Now let's talk about organizations like the army and the police. Now, I would bring in a request, Dr. Fayodandan, to comment on this. Now, I d based on empirical researches, it has been found that supervision is a major motivating factor. It is not a hygiene factor uh, when you talk of police and paramilitary organizations. Yeah. Okay, and interpersonal relations at the workplace are important in certain kinds of organizations, especially, let's say, small-scale and cottage industries. Now, this learners should uh, here understand very, very, uh, very clearly that you should try to understand each theory. You have to apply your mind to understanding each theory. After giving the hygiene factors and motivation factors, it is very important to come down to criticisms as given by theorists and then try to apply your mind to understanding that particular theory. Now, importantly, as I said earlier, each uh, sort of school is an improvement over the earlier school. Now, human relations stressed mainly on interpersonal relations and supervision. Factors like interpersonal relations and supervision as contributing directly to productivity. <coughs> but Herzberg sort of contradicts that. He puts supervision and interpersonal relations in hygiene factors, not in motivating factors. So he says fringe and tax benefits and better pay, better perks or better supervision or let's say better interpersonal relations are not going to motivate a person to better productivity. Now let's come to motivators or let's say what Herzberg understands as factors that motivate a person to contribute his best to an organization. Now those factors are work content, what a person is expected to do. I mean, are you relishing your work? Are you enjoying your work? That is most important. Then he says the amount of responsibility that you get out of your work, your opportunity for advancement, how much you are recognized. Okay. Now let's try to critically analyze, critically understand each motivating factor over here. Now interestingly there was a research you must have, uh, for public administration students I would strongly recommend that you must read magazines and periodicals and newspapers. Uh, it, is, it is a must because public administration I've told you is a practical art and you cannot sort of, reading magazines and periodicals is indispensable. Now there was a research some time back which sort of listed all of these, it was based specifically on Herzberg's two-factor theory and the results were absolutely astounding, I would, uh, rather unfortunate actually. Now the factors which are placed as motivators, let's say responsibility, advancement and recognition and work content, were sort of figuring among low priorities within corporates and uh, let's say factors like pay and perks and security, these kind of factors were topmost. Now uh, that is a very, uh, that is a, let's say a challenge for the academic fraternity because we are talking Herzberg in the one place and on the other hand we are talking of a survey. Dr. Vayunandan also talked about the importance of empirical studies and empirical researches and data. Uh, now largely this fact, this theory will be accepted, it is an accredited theory, it is applicable to all cultural situations but this survey is a sort of a contradiction and it was uh, done pretty recently. So let's just try to uh, recap, let's do a recap I of hygiene uh, factors. I think I should uh, also, I think this, uh, that is what you said, na, this, uh, the, later, the, the survey or some research which has come out that whatever the hygienic factors are, the motivating factors. The hygiene factors <laughs> are coming on yeah. the top okay, priority yeah, yeah. and work content yeah. responsibility. See, so what is wrong? Yeah, is yeah. something wrong with yeah. the organization right management as such? Supervision, interpersonal relation is one of the very important motivating factors. That's hygiene. Uh, which yeah, I think he has uh, categorized in the hygienic hygiene. factors which lead to, if they are provided, 
okay it is, if they're not provided yeah. it doesn't really yeah. matter See, it, i mean the, 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 there is also one uh, thing which we have to also look at he said dissatisfaction does not lead to satisfaction mm -hmm. Dis satisfaction does not lead to dissatisfaction now uh, <laughs> learners this is not meant to disillusion you yeah. okay now you have to be a yeah. we are reading motivation thinkers we are reading about masto we are reading about us but this is just meant to stimulate your mind to stimulate your thinking and uh, i would also talk about let's say um, also talk about the cultural context over here when we talk about india we are talking more in terms of let's say spirituality and it's also very important to look at both material and spiritual aspects of living uh now uh, we are talking more about contractual employment over here so in the new liberal paradigm uh, so you are doing away with security uh, totally and you are also doing away with self esteem Yeah, so right. uh, so what what really which which direction are we really headed when we are talking of globalization i think when you if you if you give more leeway to private sector organizations you're talking more about scientific management and more about uh, the one best way of doing things and you just told what to do and you just follow <coughs> orders so uh, but still it is motivation at the workplace does remain a mystery when we talk in terms of uh, even when we talk in terms of material welfare some people have very strong affiliation needs and let's say your boss might be very touchy about you you're not saying good morning every day to him yeah. and that might cost you your job i mean that's funny but certain people might just not mind it yeah. and as far as physiological need or let's again material welfare is concerned we've got big corporates who've got to a stinking rich who sort of indulge in absolute in corruption which is not understandable as per maslow's understanding if physiological needs are satisfied you had a spiritual swami exploiting girls you just had uh, the report uh, in the media it's very important to think so despite having your physiological needs satisfied you can indulge in absolute terrible mal practices to there is absolutely no end this is what you call lust so i think it's very important for an organization to prioritize <coughs> i mean to what extent you have to cater to the physio physiological needs of an individual which level you're talking by you talking of let's say the primary the basic level are you talking or you talking of comforts or you're talking of luxuries that in the west they're talking more in terms of luxuries but still motivation is a problem you've got people from india going into western countries and showing showing a lot of motivation at the workplace and motivating their own employees is a problem for their own organization and uh, understanding the behavior of indian corporates is a mystery over there so i think uh, when you talk of motivation there has to be continued research continued study as we just gave an example of one research it's very important to follow periodicals to read biographies of people like nehru or people like gandhi people like lenin what motivated them to uh, the great heights which you can call self actualization like let's say gandhi was an ideal leader so he had reached let's say the stage of self actual self actualization now when we celebrate teachers day we are talking of a person uh, mr radha krishnan who had reached a position of self actualization so when you you are not just looking at you know let's a, a lecturer wanting to be a reader or reader wanting to be a professor or something we we are not looking at positions or promotions we are looking more at what sort of motivates uh, motivates us what us a feeling of self worth what what is the ultimate goal we, you are looking at it's very important i think uh, for an uh, organization head to have a one to one interaction with each member of an organization to understand his people very well and here again we are talking of human relations we are talking of one to one contact we are talking of what each and every member aspires for in an organization because uh, here i'll bring in chester barnard who says an organization is in a state of equilibrium internal equilibrium when let's say the inducements offered to an each individual member of an organization balance the contributions that you get now whenever that balance is disturbed the organization is said to be in a state of disequilibrium that equilibrium has to be brought back and that is the function of the executive uh talking of interpersonal relations to what extent it, it is a hygiene factor or a motivation factor i think i will enter into a i'll request dr vyanandan to please enter into a discussion over here let's let's talk about interpersonal relations and to what extent do you think hersberg is right in classifying it as a hygiene factor yeah you are very right i think a uh, lot of things which are listed in the hygienic factors are mostly 
once we try to relate and also apply day, it day to day activity. i think most of them are uh, mostly motivating factors mm. and various earlier theories also talks about these aspects as one of the motivating aspects mm-hmm. but uh, first we I mean i mean the it does ha- not undermine yeah, the yeah, contribution yeah, yeah, yeah. of either the human yeah, relations yeah. school or even one, the behavioral school one thing school. is i think uh, uh, frederick hirschberg i think uh, when he came out with this uh, two factors or uh, what you call the two factors theory or the hygiene hygiene and motivational theories i think the the research he has done on basis which he has come out i think he has uh, applied a questionnaire on the already that is the chartered accountants and uh, in uh, the west yeah mid and west and they have i think one way they have reached all those things which were motivating factors to others now they are in a verge of getting some sort of status some sort of a what to call position uh, some cost uh, achieve i mean so in that context i think the chartered accountants are already a white collared employee so naturally they not, does not need pay perks or uh, supervision they are not Absolutely. they are in a position to supervise they are not in a position to they are being supervised but hersberg <laughs> is a very good empirical model to apply yeah. for research yeah I think in case of each specific organization in case of let's say small scale industry or different sectors tertiary sector secondary sector primary sectors I think this theory is a serves as a very good empirical yes. model despite criticisms yeah. to apply and to know in each particular case yeah. what is the motivating factor yes. and sort of that can be addressed yeah. through policy yeah. so one way if you look into that maslow and hertzberg i think uh, the lowest needs which are mostly talked by maslow are nothing but the maintenance and maintenance man- things absolutely uh, you can relate uh, maslow yeah, yeah. and hertzberg the, the higher factors which i mean higher level uh, advancement needs, uh, and responsibility uh, uh, relate to self but actualization but only thing is what is the criteria or what is the uh, i mean uh, what you call <laughs> when you say that satisfaction leads do not lead to dissatisfaction and dissatisfaction does not lead to satisfaction and what what he says primarily is that hygiene factors do not really make a difference to your performance they are just maintenance factors and besides pay and perks he lists importantly supervision and interpersonal relations which is a contradiction of the human relations school so when you when you were reading the criticism of human relations school and when you were sort of advancing to the behavioral school you have to understand that each is a progression over the other so you have to appreciate the criticism more rather yeah. than sort of understand it in definitive terms yeah. understand it more in relative terms yeah. so human relations are important but then you have to get more deeply into yeah. the behavioral aspects of of yeah. each individual to get to yeah. get more diagnostic diagnostic in the sense that you sort of pick out yeah. the real factor in case of each individual yeah. treated as a single unit and sort of address that through formal or informal means informal means could be any uh, could be interaction could be understanding could be a one to one talk or formal means could be policy yeah maybe change in organizational policy or we can even talk in terms of national policy now in the newspapers today significantly you must have noticed they are talking of uh, criteria to assess students they are talking of uh, numbers are numbers the right criteria to judge students let's say does a 75% student stand uh, sort of categorized meritorious or let's say do we have subjective factors to judge students number of attendance or let's say the num- uh, the performance in class questions asked or, or normal behavior pattern and these 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 sort of things so they're already talking of they're already thinking about the education system they're talking they're thinking about the examinations the system and accordingly applying with this kind of understanding as i said earlier public administration is an applied field it is both an art and a science based on this understanding it is very important for the government for each organization to chalk out its own policy because ultimately an organization is a social unit it's yeah. composed of individuals and these factors the own uh, requirements and the requirements of the organizations have to match in case of a mismatch as said by just bernard very rightly the organization sort of stands the risk of being in a position of disequilibrium yeah you are very right as you have rightly mentioned that uh, the satisfaction 
Uh, the contribution satisfaction equilibrium. I think that way. I think Bernard, mm-hmm. even there was a practitioner who is having absolutely. A, a I think the best. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You said, see how is it? One person, per person who contributes naturally has to in be return, induced in return satisfaction, which is more than satisfaction, and that satisfaction again is both it, material how? and by inducement. What inducement? Then again, the leader of the organization should. Yeah. Know at what point of time this the person what intervention would, uh, yeah, is necessary. Necessary, and yeah. what kind of inducement he has to be. Absolutely. So that is, I think, I mean, w- when you say this two-factor theory, these are the hygienic factors, these are motivating mm-hmm. factors, and these not, are to the, yeah, yeah, not to be put so in strict compartments. Not to be put in strict compartments. That is what I think. is very clear. Very clear. Say that the the leader, the executive should function know of what, the executive. Yeah. So and then he gives inducement and incentives. What Absolutely. <laughs> Specific so, inducements yeah, and. Yeah. The so other I think that is what I think. One way, as I said earlier, also the criticism about I mean the, the maybe Herzberg arrived because uh, his uh, task I mean his target group are the people who whom he has I mean taken as a group to study or do some sort of as, as a research based on which he has arrived at with these two factors theory. Most probably they are all white collared, so they are in a verge of getting some sort. They all got all the. Aspects which is he mentioned. Absolutely, now and it's also a, a Western culture <laughs> yeah, where Western basically culture, yes, yes. physiological yeah. needs are mostly yeah, satisfied. Sir. So that way they may be, and that's <coughs> what I said, uh, culturally, economically, socially, they are advanced in that. Yes, so context absolutely. they are more towards Naturally. the achievement <laughs> recognition. Maybe that and that be, survey was an antagonism. Yeah, absolutely, that cannot be that's basically uh, generalized. And say that these are the factors. But which it are is an empirical yes, model that yes, is the desideratum yes, we yes. arrive at. That yeah. is what we want to convey to our learners. Mm. This empirical model should be used when you do your PhDs and you conduct your surveys and researches. Herzberg two-factor theory is important to just apply, yes. carry out your research, and to find out in each case yes. what sort of is the main factor. Mm. Responsible in each case for motivation or hygiene, so sort of, and craft policy uh, in that regard uh, you mean based that on that. It is a model where you it can. It is a model. You can then come out. Absolutely. And, and, and then you can say accordingly. You can accordingly. Make we, you can yes, make. absolutely. But whereas Maslow, I think uh, you say he has rightly said these are the needs. Yeah, basically, I think uh-huh. Maslow is a framework, yeah. basic framework, which says okay, there are physiological, and yes. there is little disputation regarding Maslow. Yes. He says there is there are physiological needs. Yes. Obviously, there are security needs, and Same they can be arranged in terms of. Hierarchy. Now there could be a little dispute, dispute. about that. Now uh, there have been valid criticisms about yes. certain people have more affiliation needs, certain yes. people have more security needs, certain yes. people could be corrupt despite having their physiological needs deep, satisfied. Deep, it's very, deep, deep. very difficult to yes. understand what really motive. But broadly, yeah. if we take uh, like there are two perspectives to life. Yes. One, let's say theory X, which says all people are bad. Yes. That we have a negative perception to life. Nothing absolutely goes right with the world. And um, and theory Y, the second perspective, is says positive. Be yes. positive. Look at the world is yeah. good. People are good. Yeah. Sort of this, this this kind of an understanding, but theory Y application. I think yeah. Maslow's framework, the physiological yes. security yes. needs, is broadly acceptable. And uh, this is, I think, in the end, we would like to say that uh, Herzberg's model serves as an a good empirical tool yeah. and Maslow's is a basic framework which sort of builds the foundation or sort of is the foundation which is used by subsequent researchers like Herzberg and sort of others which chronologically follow to build their theories on subsequently. So Dr. Vaidandan, if you would like I to. I think uh, that is what we try to discuss and uh, we try to provide the views of the various, uh, I mean that is two scholars on the, so I hope uh, you uh, got the in insights of this uh, socio-psychological approach, the both the views. I hope this uh, was uh, very, very educative and I once again thank you for uh, listening to this uh, session I, on behalf of the Faculty of Public Affairs. Thank you. Thank you.